This episode of the Party Loaded Podcast is proudly sponsored by Audible.com. Check out their awesome catalogue of audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from. And be sure to grab a free audiobook on us and support the show by visiting audibletrial.com slash endgame. Let's party. Hello everybody, it is Wednesday the 26th of April. My name is Luke Retallick and you are listening to Party Loaded, the video gaming podcast. Uh, joining me tonight, as always, we have Jam and Imogen. Hello ladies, how are you going? Hola. Hello, Ooh. I like how I've um, merged into Imogen for some reason for today's podcast. But yeah. Well, we have, some, we have some extra bodies on seats tonight, so I thought, you know, we can't make the intro long and drawn out with the usual crew because, you know, if you haven't been listening for the last 70 plus episodes, you may not know who we are, but I'm going to assume that you do, so <laughs> we'll, we'll just roll with that. Ollie's not with us tonight, unfortunately, uh, but filling the the bald one's chair, he's going to crack me in the head for that later. Uh, he is going to kill you. Well, yeah, yeah. No, he won't listen. I'll be be fine. Um, <laughs> we have a couple of special guests. Uh, we have returning to the show. I'm going to call her the uh, the Surfire Managing Matriarch. We have V Pendergrast. Welcome back. Hi. <laughs> and uh, that tells in nicely to uh, for the first time visiting Party Loaded. We have uh, Mr. Matt Diet, who I'm going to call the Surfire Producer Patriarch. Hello. Hello. Um, also, Game Dad would work. Yeah. Well, Patriarch yeah. Dad, that was the kind of angle I was going for. So, yeah. <laughs> I would just like to point out at this appropriate juncture that between my mop of black hair and Matt, in just in general, we are adequately hirsute enough to counter the baldness. Sure. <laughs> I was going to point out the same thing, actually. <laughs> Good job. The same page. So, so what you need to do next time you're doing the trim is just get a little doily bag and we'll ship that over to Ollie, wherever he may be. And just no explanation. We'll just let him work it out. <laughs> <laughs> He can do that at his own leisure. Starts receiving hair in the mail. Oh. Yeah. That would be awesome. (laughs) Express post from Stirfire Studios and he'll be like, what the fuck kind of AR is this? (laughs) 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 Oh, no. Well, anyway, we um we have uh, both of you here tonight to talk about some pretty exciting stuff. Uh, Stirfire Studios, in particular, is having a big week this week because you have literally just as of yesterday, and I'm going to get this wrong, uh, three p.m. Western Australia time, launched your your big game. Am I right on the time? Is that pretty much on on the money? Ish. Ish. Okay, let's call it ish because <laughs> nothing ever goes completely you know perfectly Ray. in plan. So, uh, <laughs> Symphony of the Machine. We've mentioned the uh, the game many times on the show before. In fact, um, we actually conducted an interview with yourself, V, and, uh, and Lisa Rye at uh, PAX Australia 2016, which is up on our YouTube channel at Channel Endgame. Um, and uh, that was just a little sort of, you know, 10-minute snippet um, discussion of some of the stuff that was going on behind the scenes with the game. But uh, really looking forward to digging into a chat with both of you tonight to, to you know, talk about the development um, journey for Symphony and um, and chat a bit more about what's going on at Stairfire. So thank you both for taking the time. It's going to be good fun. And congratulations. Yeah. Yeah, it's That's super awesome. exciting. It oh, actually yeah. happened, and and it hasn't aged either of us at all. Not one <laughs> You've not come down from the high yet, though. We'll see what the hangover feels like when that actually all uh, It's up. not a high so much of an, oh, God, it's over. Yeah. <laughs> I am just loving seeing people who I don't know have a direct connection to Stirfire sharing that the game is launching with me, and I love it. Yeah. I've had somebody email me saying, oh, this launched in Perth. Aren't you in Perth? <laughs> um, so, do you know anything like, about this? I do know anything. Yeah, it's like this looks really cool. You should check it out. I'm like, funny, you should mention that. <laughs> My my personal favourite moment was when uh, was when a friend of mine actually sent me a message the day that we put out our, our teaser trailer, saying saying, "Hey, have you seen this new PlayStation VR game?" And he sent me my own trailer. <laughs> 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 and it's like, dude, just watch to the end of the uh, trailer there, and you watch this to the end, and it goes, oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> this uh, sounds like your game. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a big tick for the marketing team there, really, isn't it? They're doing their job. <laughs> <laughs> Not relying on your own <laughs> networks. That's great. Oh, no. Well, anyway, before we sort of jump the gun and get too much into to the Symphony of the Machine stuff, um, just for the benefit of people who might have missed you on the first time uh, round on the show, uh, V, uh, can we just do a very, very quick introduction for yourself and, and what you do as uh, Managing Director at Stirfire? I'll uh, let you take it away. So my name is V. I'm the Managing Director. Mm. Uh, I do all the not game things. So I <laughs> handle the actual paying for the people and the financing of the exercise and all the legals and the marketing, I coordinate with that. Well, Matt, Matt handles our PR company specifically, but all around the outside and um, basically um, it takes all the developers and gives them hugs whenever they need it as well. Yeah, that's what I do. Um, the commercial aspect of getting a game to market. Totally the Chief Warm and Fuzzies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Um, so, Matt, uh, now we have not spoken to you b- before on the show. So, would you like to give us a little bit of an intro as to what the heck you do and what is a game producer in the realm of uh, what you've been doing with Symphony of the Machine and Stirfire in general? So, go for it. Um, it's always it's always really complicated uh, to answer that question because everybody has a different impression as to what a producer does. But basically, the reason I like throwing around the title Game Dad um, is because I make sure that the kids get to dinner, or get to get to bed on time and have dinner. That's also a good one. Um, and they're doing their homework. And so basically, that's my, my primary role at the studio is making sure that everybody can get their work done um, and they don't have anything blocking them. I also work pretty much directly with um, all of our publishing partners like Sony and, and Vive. All that sort of thing. Nice. I'm going to yep. assume that um, unlike most dads, you don't um, you know, punish your kids for not having done their work by telling them they can't have any computer time. It's kind of the opposite in this respect. Isn't yeah. It? <laughs> You're not reducing screen time at all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And, and he has case, confi- he has confiscated my dessert form from me as several ooh. occasions. Oh. <laughs> We're going to get into that's some juicy lie. tales tonight. <laughs> you risk limbs if you'd stole desserts from me, that's for sure. <laughs> nice. So uh, when uh, when you're not giving V her just desserts, uh, what else? Oh, <laughs> oh, oh man, why? It in Sorry. There it is. Oh, <laughs> uh, goodness. So, um, but particularly um, sort of, uh, you know, coming to the role that you're in, what what, what was your background in, um, in game development uh, sort of prior to that that led you to the role at Stirfire? What was it my background in game development? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I started out um, studying web development, um, actually, at TAFE. Um, and then from there, I heard about a game development course. And I was like, that sounds cool. Um, so I went there and I actually studied technical art, which covers both programming and art. Mm-hmm. Um, at the end of that, I was with a team. That team ended up voting me into the role of producer, which got me first interested in it. Um, then I went to university, uh, managed to get my marks high enough that I could start to define um, what units I took rather than just following the course plan. So by the time I graduated, I basically hadn't taken anything that the, the university intended me to take. And I instead <laughs> just made this weird thing that became my production course. Once I left, um, I did some work with SciTech and a whole bunch of stuff basically there, always messing around with programming and art basically. Um, so that allows me to communicate with all the team. I understand what programmers are saying. I understand what artists are saying. Um, I'm not as good as what they do, but I understand it. So nice. You sort of can't sounding a bit like the uh, the protocol droid of the operation, kind of yeah. putting all those links together. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. But, you, know, you know, the programmers are Java, um, and you need the protocol droid there to translate to the artists um, what exactly Java is saying. Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, um, all right. Well, let, let's uh, sort of dig into a little bit of uh, symphony chat. So, um, I, I mean, you can both sort of dive in wherever you feel appropriate. But um, I, I guess we're really keen to to learn about how the whole journey with um symphony of the machine getting developed has, has gone from from go to woe. I mean, I think the three of us have um had a, enough of hands on time and chatting to to uh you know various people at Stirfire to sort of understand the genesis of the, the game idea happened at a game jam a couple of years ago. But uh, yeah, what actually took place and, and what's happened since? Everything's happened. Um, <laughs> we, we started off um, with the, the game jam concept, obviously. And so, yeah. so Global Game Jam 2016, better go into that one. Mm. Yeah. Yes, that's a good point. <laughs> Wasn't this year's game jam. We've been game jamming for the last 12 months, basically. Um, wow. <laughs> so we had that... Um, and everybody was super interested um, in Symphony as, as an idea. 
So we ended up taking it. Um, I, every single year I fly over to San Francisco and I go to the Game Developers Conference. And we actually managed to line up some meetings with Sony. Through those meetings, um, Sony gave us a bunch of advice and expressed an interest in the game. We came back. I came back to Perth, took back that feedback, and we completely changed the game from what the concept was in, in the Game Jam in 2016 to something that was similar, um, but that the way it played out was completely different. Um, and from there, we had financing come in, which was all V's fault. <laughs> <laughs> it's, nice, it's nice when people can actually have jobs that pay money and they can yes. buy groceries and things like that. Because, I mean, that, that's the thing as well, is it, that in Western Australia, it's fair to say there is still very little on the ground in terms of funding. Hmm. Uh, yeah. We don't have government support saving models yet. We will do. That's all That's all coming. And, and I had a hand in that one as well. But uh, so we, we basically moved towards a model where we would be going towards some private financing. So basically that kicked in from June last year. And to say that everyone has been absolutely flat out ever since on this thing is just an understatement. It is we've literally done an eighteen month project in eight months. Wow, that's nuts. I knew it hadn't been uh, you know started off at a game jam, but I didn't realize it was twenty sixteen game jam. <laughs> that's insane. Can you put, put this in context for people who don't know. A game jam is where like global game jam is is a. Uh, worldwide phenomenon every year in January where a bunch of, of um, game devs walk in at various sites around the world. It takes place pretty much in every major capital city. You've got more or less 50 hours, Matt. Is that a fairly uh, fairly good indication of how long? 50 hours for, for, for developing game from, from, from concept to actually jamming out the game at the end of it. It would actually, it would actually be less than that. It would be less than 48 yeah, well, forty. Yeah, just just less than forty eight hours to from go to woe, and then you've got to try and arrive at something at the end of that. Now I can't do that because I'm not a programmer or artist or anyone with any actual talent or skill. So they, everybody walks into that that scenario, and then they walk out with with a concept. It's not going to be fully formed because hey, look, you've got forty eight hours or thereabouts. But that's when when our team basically walked into that, they came out with the original version of Symphony, and that's what sparked the concept, and that's what Sony really bought into from an from an idea perspective. Uh, to be fair, though, V, you could get everybody paid in that 48 hours. <sighs> yeah, that's that. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know that I would be dismissing your skills just yet, V. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I mean, you not only did you get a game developed and released by by 2017, you also had a, the the booth at PAX. It's just blowing my mind now that I know it was 2016. I had automatically assumed it was 2015. So that's absolutely insane and great job. <laughs> uh, v, v had mentioned the fact that we were working on the game for 12 months, but when you actually look back at the development cycle, it was more like six um, mm. because wow. half of that time was when we were still a, a hobbyist studio and people weren't really getting paid. We are having to take a bunch of side projects to keep the studio afloat and to keep people working, basically. Yeah, pay um, people when we could, um, shuffle through project to project, try and siphon the money from one side to the other. But, I mean, the thing being is that, that we finally managed to find an investment partner. I mean, I was working on that for two years, and then finding an investment model and a partner and someone who was willing to work with us because, of course, um, trying to find investment in games is really hard because you walk into a, a room full of 50-something investors and you say, the word, hey, I've got this awesome game. It's going to make a ton of money. And everyone's eyes just close over right there, whereas this guy actually saw the vision. And because we had that partnership with Sony, he understood that that's where we were going with it. Hmm. Mm. That must have been an amazing meeting with Sony, Matt. To, to come out of that meeting with them saying, and we're interested in the game, I think you might have just flown yourself back to Australia. Yeah. <laughs> that. <laughs> that whole meeting was was really incredible because um, the way it played out was completely unexpected. Like, so this was, this was my first time ever actually sitting down with somebody from a big company like Sony. And I'm there, of course, you know, my heart's racing, I'm freaking out. And I'm just trying to sell up the game as best I can. And because this is the Game Jam version of the game, it's running on uh, on, on the samsung galaxy headset thing yeah the gear vr the gear vr yep so i mean we're not even actually releasing on the gear vr now because that's how much the game has changed but he ends up sitting there playing it with the headset on and everything and he's dead silent while he's playing and i'm like is he actually enjoying it so i'm talking to him about what our plans are for the future 
and he ends up taking the headset off and he's like are you busy tomorrow? And I'm like, no. And he's like, well, I'd really like you to have a meeting with our representative from Japan because I think they would be all over this. And <laughs> so it went from it went from just having a meeting with um, somebody from Sony Europe to also having a meeting with somebody from Sony Japan, Whoa. getting all their contact details, and then just constantly having contact with them for the whole 12 months of development. Nice. Amazing. So I, I was just going to ask, so when, when you sort of sign on to be partnered with Sony, like what, what does that actually mean in, in nuts and bolts terms? Is that is that a commitment to release on uh, that platform within a set window or is that a, a sort of guarantee of a certain amount of support in the development lead up where they provide you with information about their um, their platform and, uh, you know, different things you need to consider during the design process? What, what actually is involved in that partnership? So the, the partnership with Sony is really all about them allowing you access to their platform. Mm -hmm. Um because it is, a, it is a closed platform, right? And so basically what you're agreeing to in that situation, there's, there's nothing that you establish with them specifically that is contractual, like, we're going to release on this date. Instead, it's more like, we will be working on this game with you and you will provide us assistance in making it. And then once we release it, Sony will take their cut, we'll take our cut, and everybody wins. Hmm. It, it depends on what the form of the agreement of the actual individual project means. I mean, later on, it's, for the sake of the, of the argument, if you were to look at something like an exclusivity, I mean, there, there would be something monetary in there and all that. Um, assistance actually getting on the platform is a huge thing because, you, I mean, you can apply to get into Sony or you can apply to get onto Xbox or one of those things. Your chances are you're not going to get through unless they like you, unless they see something in it. And we were very fortunate on that occasion that it's happened and, and we're there. We're just and watching ourselves um, turning up gradually around the world at the moment. Yeah, it's huge. Is there any part of producing a game with a big developer like Sony that is just vastly different than you would expect? Do you mean, did you take it on and there was just one aspect that you were just like, wow, that was entirely unexpected? Or was it as difficult or as protocol driven as you expected? Yes, um, and you should just censor me for like the next 15 minutes while I rant about that. Oh, okay. <laughs> and go. <laughs> um, beep, just a long beep. Yeah. We, we, we've got to be careful on NDA here. It's, 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 yeah. it's pretty big, but it, it, it was a challenge. And I think um, playing my role as Matt's counsellor during this time, it, it has been a significant endeavour. Yeah, yeah, so... Basically, I think the thing that was a big takeaway from us was, like, we, we went through Sony um, to essentially self-publish the title. And the takeaway that I personally had once we actually got Symphony out was, like, wow, suddenly I can really understand why you might want a publisher. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a lot of work. It's a mm. lot of work to deal with a company like Sony because you're dealing with several different regions that all have their own different rules. Mm. Um it's not like Steam where you can go and upload a game, flick a switch, and suddenly you're deployed to the whole world, right? Yeah, yeah. Because we see a lot of games, I mean, we talk about a lot of sort of indie developed and smaller studio games where we love them on Steam and we'd love to be able to play them on console, but we're starting to very, I'm starting to get a very clear picture of that that's a very huge step. It's not an incremental process that you can do. You take all or you take nothing. <laughs> But you've got the experience now, so, hmm. you know, next game. <laughs> yes. Are you allowed to start thinking about a next game when you just released it at the previous game? <laughs> yeah, funny that. <laughs> <laughs> um, just bathe in the glory for a bit. <laughs> from, a, from a team psychology thing, in, in my personal opinion, because, like, V and I are both very much people that are, like, uh, the studio has to be happy and healthy in order to be making great games, mm. right? Mm. And the only way for us to do that is for there to be a definitive end to a project where they can turn around and say, okay, it's done. But with releasing a game, um, especially on a platform like um, what Sony has, PlayStation, that day isn't the release day. That day should actually be like a month or two before the release day. Mm -hmm. And so that's really the point where you start thinking more about what you're doing next. Mm -hmm. it's, it's actually a much, much longer before the game comes out. Mm. Do you take the time, I mean, I, in my day job, do a lot about leadership and, and, and talking to younger people about leadership and what they think it is. And one critical thing that they always say is that lead, and probably that in the real world we don't do, is a thing called sharpening the saw. And that's that time to take time out for yourselves and to sort of celebrate what you've done. 
are you guys taking that time out or is it not allowed for in the West Australia gaming industry? <laughs> it's not it's, it's not in the budget. <laughs> yeah, so I mean my thing really is so last week I found myself in Melbourne just going out and talking to other game studios. Mm. I won't call it like I'm not sitting there behind my desk pushing Excel, which is what I normally do because I'm all about the numbers at the end of the day. I try and change what I'm doing. I don't really do holidays, just not yeah. really that personality, but I, I, I desperately needed to not be behind my desk at the studio. So I flew to Melbourne. Um, I'm working on, like, we, we also make games for other people and we do uh, third-party studio work as well. So I thought I'll go and, and work on those relationships. I'll catch up with people. We'll go and do some drinks and we'll do it that way. So to me, that was kind of my version of that. Um, Definitely, we are yeah. fl- we are playing it to GX Australia tomorrow with our, with a lot of our team, um, and I'll probably take some time out during this weekend to make sure I'm doing that. And so so basically, uh, um, my version of not working is to work more. <laughs> <laughs> well done. That's fair, and you know what? That it's all about your own version of it. As long as you're taking the time to realise what you guys have achieved because well, I think it's huge. <laughs> so congratulations. Absolutely. It's funny though that you mentioned um, that line sharpening the saw because um, that was actually one of the books that was recommended while I was at GDC this year, um, production mm-hmm. related talk talking about that stuff. Um, and like certainly with um, Symphony, it was something that we didn't do very well. Like all the way through development, we didn't really have that time because we were transitioning from being a, a hobbyist studio into a studio that was actually paying wages, and mm. we didn't really have much time in there to to actually think about how we were making the game um, so much as we need to make the game. Whereas on our next project, hopefully we can actually think about that a bit more. That's like I've been working on for the past month already. The other thing is to make sure the systems are in place to make sure everybody is kind of feeling fulfilled and all that. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, everyone gets so invested in a creative project and you do need to take the time just to start, pause and go, well, all right, this is why I'm doing this. Um, particularly when you're uh, so engrossed in a particular task and that's all you can see in front of you that's the real time that you need to sometimes step back and take a deep breath and, and, and do that. That sounds great. You mentioned that uh, the team's heading over to GX. Um, you also mentioned, V, uh, that you're over in Melbourne. Did you want to tell us a little bit more about maybe why you were in Melbourne? Because I know that you were nominated for something very uh, exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not why I was in Melbourne. Um, oh. I, was in, I was in Melbourne basically to drink. Um, okay, fair, fair. <laughs> we can relate the okay, two. Fair. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, I, no, no. I was in Melbourne. Was all about my relationships, and the other thing too is to see as well what other studios are doing. Um, yeah, the arcade. To, a, yeah, like walk into the store. arcade. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I, I get seventeen hugs before I, I get to the to the actual. Um, actual meeting that I'm walking into on any given day, and that's mostly because I changed my deodorant. Um, <laughs> it is, it's, the arcade is in a massive community, and we just, despite the fact that Perth has a really vibrant community, it's mainly just hobbyists here, whereas there are some serious hardcore studios that are doing amazing things in there, and it's all about, I mean, I don't really, uh, for me to get to GDC is not, so much reality at the moment just for, for various reasons mm. yeah. but it was part of me building up my education of what these other studios are doing and what what's good what are they doing what are they struggling with what how can we do that better what's the best practice on that um the other thing too is it's not like i'm walking into those conversations and just saying hey tell me about all your stuff because my background now with major finance it, there's there's no one else really doing it doing what we're doing how we're doing it in terms of that at the moment so of oh. course everyone wants to know where the money comes from right yeah. um the next thing so to gx we're flying off tomorrow we're actually sponsoring gx australia and for those who don't know what that is that's gamer x australia g-a-y-m-e-r that, that version of gamer it's a queer gaming convention and 
uh, sponsoring it is part of our whole community thing because we're always uh, we're always very conscious about throwing back into what we're doing. Mm. Um, this one is not a commercial um, it's not a commercial enterprise so much like Pax is. It's a no. small convention with a niche audience, um, and we wanted to be able to throw back into that particular community. So that that's why we're doing that. I'm really happy you are. We spoke about a little bit on the podcast uh, when they announced that this would be the final version of GX as well. So um, people who listen to the podcast on a regular basis will, will understand, you know, we had to chat about the funding and um, then putting up the Kickstarter campaign. So I'm excited to see you guys there. Well, I mean, the other thing too is it's it, one of the executives of it is Liam Esler, who's a personal friend of mine. And when mm. they first announced that they needed some help, I mean, we just stepped up and went, we have to do this. We have to support them. Yeah. Um, mm. it, it means a lot to me as a queer person as well. Um, so I, I just went, well, let's just, Brendan, who's my, my former business partner, now director in our studio as it's, as, as it's become, uh, we both went, okay, let's sponsor this and let's get them out as much as we can and, and do what we can to support them. Um, the other thing that I, that I, that happened to me during the last couple of weeks is that I was nominated in the MCV Pacific, which is our industry body. I was nominated in the top 30 women in games for Australia. So, and we were um, so happy for you. Congratulations. Um, I will point out as well, separately, um, our Sophie Mather, who is basically the legs of our outfit. Mm. Um, she is one part <laughs> producer protege she's 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 game dad's padawan um <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> she is also she's also uh like our, our basically manages all of our expo presences she w- works in our community managers she's, she's done a stack of qa for uh symphony of the machine mm. so much help and also like she's uh, the work that she did with sk games and all that she's been separately nominated for the, the, the five MCV Pacific categories this year. So she's outside of the 30, but she's still um, nom- nominated for their five categories. Um, she was nominated as their un- um, their Unseen Achiever category, I think it was. Yeah. Um, we saw her talk um, during the Pixel Sift panel at Oz Comic Con. Jam and I went down yeah. and, and listened to her talk and... You know, she's just, you know, she's part of everything. And, and if you've got a question about something, she's probably knows. <laughs> yeah. In regards to Stirfire, she's um, she's a real gun. V, v did reveal to me a couple of weeks ago that uh, she was in charge of making sure that V ate. So. <laughs> <laughs> There Very important are da- job. <laughs> there are days when, honestly, that she just basically keeps me alive, and and that's a thing mm. because I, I mean, I, I'm dealing, I'm in and out of investor meetings most of the time, or I'm balancing something, or I spend most of my time dealing with lawyers and accountants, which is not glamorous, but it's the thing that needs to be done to make sure that the game developers can make the game. Mm. So that's all all part of the gig, and Sophie, of course, is a big part of keeping me going on a day to day basis with that. Yeah. Now, I so mean, the other, we're just happy to see so many West Australians on there, to be honest. So, in the, in the top thirty list, um, and the, the big lunch in Darling Harbour is on Tuesday next week. Um, so there were five West Australians in the top thirty list, which is just a general top thirty of of who's rocking out in games in Australia. And for mm. five West Australians to get that, that is out of out of thirty people. When there's only a nascent industry here, that's just incredible. Yeah, that's an it's a testament to the hard work that that every single one of you do to boost our community. And I, I I tweeted it out when it happened, and I really mean it. I mean, without you guys leading the way, I mean, you find you must find people more and more every time you speak to someone. The sort of momentum starting to grow, and you know, someone's always got to start that. And it feels like it was you five. <laughs> so I was commenting to Matt last week that april 2017 is the first month that two really polished commercial released games have exited wa in one month mm. the other one of course being paradigm from uh jacob janoka yep i think that uh, matt can you prove me wrong on that or is that i'm pretty sure that's a first um, yeah. the community <laughs> here in, in western australia is is growing really really fast and i think we always blow um, people's minds whenever we go over to Melbourne for Melbourne International Games Week and um, all the Perth developers get together and, and take a, a big group photo of all the Perth people. And every single year, it's always a bigger group. And every single year, all the people in Melbourne are like, wow, Perth's game development community is that big? 
<laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Something that got said to me last week by a notable person in the industry. She she said, "Wow, you're 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 small, but you're noisy." <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic that's, that's the title of my autobiography V. because <laughs> <laughs> you, you weren't even just settling with showing symphony at the last packs so you also had debug showing there how's that going well what's coming next yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so uh, so debug was sitting in prototype form and I, i'm gonna let matt talk about that one so yeah so debug um, funnily enough, we were working on debug before Symphony was getting worked on. Um, wow. And then huh. we got to the Global Game Jam last year and we made Symphony. And uh, game developers apparently have a really short attention span because we're like, we want to make this thing now. Um, <laughs> and so for us, like, it's actually it's actually been really, really beneficial because the, the scope of what debug was going to be back before the Global Game Jam last year was a fairly small puzzle platformer. And then we got money and we had Symphony release and we have a bunch of team members that had you know, been getting trained up over the course of Symphony's development. They're all on the same page now. They know the systems. They know how it works. We have worked out a whole bunch of things that we were doing wrong as a studio. Hmm. And now we go to debug with a stronger team than what we would have had if we were just working on it before Symphony. So, yes, that's the next one. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. So your experience is going to evolve the, the little nugget of an idea that you had. I think the other thing that's happened with it is Debug has really uh, matured through time as well mm -hmm. because I can remember the first time that we encountered, that we had Debug and I had the prototype and I did put it in front of someone at Sony and, and, and – um, that meeting was not particularly favorable. The difference being is when we took the PAX prototype out last time, and that was really the acid test of, is this thing good? And, of course, the Sony and the Microsoft peeps all came and played it, and they all went, okay, now you've got it. I mean, I distinctly remember that first time around, and and the meeting didn't go well, and the, the account manager from the major vendor said, you just ha haven't got this yet. There's something in there. You, you you don't own the space, his words. You just don't own the space yet. You have yeah. to find that space and own it. Nice. And the thing being is now that we've got that and now that we know what debug is going to be, uh, I think it's a lot more solid going into it and we'll end up with a much better game at the end of that. The other thing too is, I mean, it, it is again, I, so I'm going to talk about money because I always talk about money. <laughs> so uh, originally we were looking at, as Matt said, a really small, tightly defined project. And there's nothing wrong with doing that apart from the fact that we're an ambitious studio amongst other things. So now we're looking at a, basically what is going to end up, at, I'm pretty certain, as a $900,000 project, which is whilst not the biggest game in the world for an indie studio from the most isolated city in the world, that's not bad. Yeah, that's a, yeah. That's a lot of couch cushion searching, for sure, to, yeah. to get that change. <laughs> Absolutely. In, in terms in terms of scale, like, compared to Symphony, that's three times the size of Symphony. Um, and, wow. and Symphony And was then some. Of, and, and then, then some, some. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Symphony, though, was lo a lot of research and development, not just making a thing, right? Like, Stirfire, funnily enough, has experience making platformers hmm. who would have known um <laughs> but where we, we didn't have experience making a vr game and so there was a lot of experimentation that had to get done to make symphony a thing whereas debug we're kind of returning to something that we know and you know we've done we, we did freedom fall we did the downward scrolling platformer thing now we're going to do a puzzle platformer and we have the puzzle development experience from symphony to drive it which is really good so nice hmm. It's going to end up as a very rich game. It's going to be an experience there where there's going to, again, it's going to, we're going to bring a lot of the uh, uh, expertise from Symphony. Those elements where there's no one single way to do a thing, non-violent outcomes, or, I mean, there'll be, you know, the, the modicum of cartoon violence in it, but it's not, you don't get a gun where you shoot people. Mm. It just doesn't work like that. So, that, so you've got to sit and figure it out, but there's no one solution. So it's about having that toolbox at a time. And that's really the same thinking that came into Symphony as well. Yeah, nice. I mean, platformers That's are awesome. personally one of my favorite genres and uh, puzzle games are pretty close behind. So this is, you know, part and parcel sounding pretty much like my thing. So I'm, I'm really keen to see more of it. I just, uh, 
having seen the visuals at, uh, at PAX in particular have, have got me quite jazzed for the look and feel of the game. I think the, the sort of techie um, aesthetic that you've gone for and the, the environment manipulation stuff is is really interesting to me. So um, looking forward to how that pans out in the future. And um, I, I mean, I played the heck out of Freedom Fall when that released too. So I, I'm personally from more of a design aspect, really curious to see what lessons have been learned between the two that have uh, evolved the way that Stirfire approaches platform games. Actually, that's what I wanted to ask too. And I was wondering if, because you were talking about leaning on your networks before V to um, gather information about the experiences from other studios. Uh, how fulfilling is it and how often do you get to yeah, put all of these lessons that you're learning back to the, the Australian industry? Oh, so my first thing being is that I want to share about what I'm doing. In fact, I'm talking on Saturday doing a thing at GX because of that non-standard ways of entering the game industry because, of course, Matt has a world full of experience and qualifications in games and I have nothing. Mm. Um, but the thing being as well is that bringing, uh, sharing what you do know. Um, you know, my background is I've got a little bit of IP law behind me, a stack of marketing. I, I, I've worked in technology go-to-market for 13 years. Um, bringing those things and sharing that information as well. You can't, like, it's all about you, you, you get more if you give more is the, the kind of the philosophy behind that. So um, VR um, being a huge focus for the business over the last, you know, eight, you know, 12 to 18 months or so. And, uh, you know, obviously as it's a burgeoning industry, it's it's really sort of new ground for a lot of devs out there and, uh, you know, a lot of consumers as well, you know, testing the waters as to whether it's going to be something they'll enjoy or not. What sort of stuff have you learned sort of looking at the industry over the last year and working on a game in the VR space um, that has made you sort of, um, sort of appreciate the level of success that VR might actually have moving forward. Is there, there anything you've particularly noticed that has made you hopeful or hesitant or, you know, what does that look like in your mind at the moment? I think um, with, with Symphony, the thing that we really did fantastically well was we ended up making a game that couldn't be played um, on another platform. Mm. Like you could only ever have Symphony exist in a VR space. Like, the whole the whole puzzle style uh, game already existed with like Portal and everything, but not in the same way that what we have with Symphony, where the manipulation has to be incredibly accurate. And the only platform that can currently do that particularly well is VR. Hmm. It was also a matter of like immersing yourself in an environment. And like one of the things that I really love um, from uh, GDC, I, every single year I go to GDC, I have really fascinating conversations um, about what I'm doing and what other people are doing. And I, I hear opinions from people based on what I tell them. Like, so this is their impression of what I'm saying. And I really like the idea that this one person told me that was like, Stirfire takes the, the current industry norms and then turns them on their head. Mm. Um, and so with Symphony, I, I feel like unknowingly we were responding to the fact that the VR space at the moment is a lot of action games where you play as a person standing in a single position, holding guns and shooting enemies that slowly trot towards the point they're standing in, right? And all in an orderly queue. <laughs> yes, all in an orderly queue. It's like they line up for the headshots. It's great. And they're incredibly popular, but they are a platform, uh, they are a game type that can exist on other platforms already, for right? Sure. Like first-person shooters are a thing. But what we set out to make was not only not an action-packed game, but it was not something that could actually be played on another platform. It was all about immersing yourself in something that could be beautiful and relaxing, which I haven't really seen a lot of other VR games out there do yet. And if, if a small indie studio in Western Australia can hook into something new and special and different and beautiful and interesting in VR, then I really cannot wait to see what a bigger studio with more money can do. Yeah. The, the spatial puzzle aspect of it, I mean, I just haven't seen anything else that's done that yet. Because, again, Symphony is about as much about moving your body and positioning, using your body as a, as a tool, as part of your toolbox, as any of the tools the game actually hands you. And I just haven't seen that anywhere else yet. I'm watching all the reviews coming through now. And whether they like it or don't like it, that is a theme that is universally commented on in most of the reviews. 
they they all want they all mention the fact that you have to position everything and you're and you're literally using that you can't play this game in two dimensions i think um as well though like i've i've had this discussion a lot with people in the studio and i think um everybody agrees for the most part that what we have with virtual reality is really exciting because if you go and compare timelines virtual reality right now is is the sea change that platformers kind of had when the nintendo 64 came out right where platformers before the nintendo 64 were typically always side scrolling and if they went into 3d they were always bad and then super mario 64 happened and it defined all platformers from there on like every platformer that has come since has always looked back at super mario 64 and has done something that that game defined we haven't had that genre-defining game in VR yet. Mm. And that's terrifying and exciting, right? Like, I think that the game that's come close to doing it is Job Simulator. Mm -hmm. Job Simulator is a a super fun, cool game, but it's a toy box. It's not a genre-defining game yet. But Mm. I think we're going to get there, and that's that's super cool. Yeah, we've seen some really uh, high-profile games um, sort of, you know, released and talked about as coming in the near future that have had a version built for VR. But to your point earlier, it's not like they've built, been built exclusively for that platform. I mean, you look at Resident Evil 7, which made waves at the beginning of the year, and the, the VR version of that, you know, got a lot of hype. But again, you can play that game without owning a VR device. It's not exactly the same kind of thing. And, um, you know, Bethesda are working on a couple of big titles later in the year too. I think, uh, you know, uh, Fallout... Um, for VR and uh, Doom, um, you know, will, will again be popular, but again, not exclusively made for that platform. So the stuff that um, really takes advantage of um, that environment, you know, is, is very, very interesting. And I, th- I think you're right. Once we get that one big title that just, you know, makes people sit up and go, I need to own one of these systems now. I've put it off long enough and now I can't play this unless I have one, pretty much. That'll be the the point of no return for a lot of people, which is just cool. I, the thing that I would say is it's definitely all in, it's still in its infancy. The, a lot of Matt's mentioned earlier on that the rules haven't been defined yet, and that's what we're seeing now is everyone's going scrabbling around trying to define what those rules are and those conventions, and you're seeing a bit of it, but there's still a lot of work to be done, and it's an exciting space to work in. Yeah. So from a numbers perspective, uh, V, because this is you know definitely your your bag. When, when we're looking at um, you know VR and, and how much it has spread out into the install base over the last sort of you know twelve months or so since it's really um, been you know probably launched um, to the consumer market. I mean, uh, Sony reported earlier in this year, I think it was in February, that they were coming up to the the million units um, mark out in the wild. How, yeah. how much nervousness does that sort of fill you with uh, looking at those numbers and you know potentially considering the alternatives when you're releasing a new game um, you know where you could be releasing something maybe not quite as complicated as working in VR to a much much wider audience um, as a you know fairly new company starting up is it something that you, you're concerned about some um, you know sacrificing uh, you know that reach for the sake of um, creativity and, and being unique or is that something that you think will sort itself out with time? Um, there's a few things going on in there. So, I mean, coming up to a million units with Sony being the numbers platform in VR currently, I mean, you're looking what devices in market, roughly 400,000 for the Vive, I think, was the last report that I saw. Yeah. Oculus, I think, roughly 200,000 devices in market. For non-numbers aficionados, um, PlayStation 4, including the PS4 Pro, has 50 million consoles plus in market right now. Mm. So again, you're tossing up on on making that commercial decision. If you look, because again, games are a commercial art form. Um, we we make games that we design to sell. Okay, so a lot of things to consider in that. Um, right now, there's not a lot of good games available in VR, so it means that you're likely to saturate more within that market. Um, the other thing, too, is to, to jump in early, um, not be first to market, but be early to market. So hopefully there's enough market there to support you once you have shipped the game and they're selling it out there in the wild uh, and actually make your money back, but establishing that brand name. I think something Steph I does really intensely is we always look at where we're going in the next uh, for the next game and the next game and the next game. Um, so jumping in and, okay, so Symphony might not in itself do hugely well, but we've then established a, a brand name and a, a space. And so then we can go and occupy that on the next round where the VR market has matured a bit. 
I think the main thing that people need to understand is that VR is not going anywhere. It's just going to grow from here. The devices will get cheaper, lighter, um, and better, and eventually they'll lose the wires off the back of them. Mm. So I, there's a, I mean, there's a million VR skeptics out there still, um, but I would suggest that they probably need to watch what the tech tree is going to do over the next few years. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you're certainly seeing a lot more people, um, you know, generally around in gaming, the understanding, you know, the nature and the concept of VR where before, you know, a year ago, you were having those conversations with them for the first time. So, you know, word is definitely getting out there. And I think the mainstream public is becoming a lot more aware of what the um, the devices are capable of as well, you know, beyond gaming is also, which is quite exciting to think about. Yeah, we work in that space as well from our services component. But the other thing too is that PlayStation are taking VR and they've just put it in your living room and that will just continue to grow. And I'm sure there will be more iterations of the device. Uh, the Xbox Scorpio has been announced for Q3 and that's supposed to have a VR capacity. We've yet to see what that looks like. Mm-hmm. We will just see growth from here on in. Uh, and the thing being as well is, again, you can do things in VR that you cannot do in a 2D uh, to the format and you can do them at, like even when there is like, like your classic Wii remote um, scenario like you, you can still do more in VR because you're occupying three dimensions yeah so Matt from your perspective scariest thing about designing a game on VR <laughs> what would you pinpoint it as I keep on saying everything can I just say it again no nah. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, designing designing interaction um, is particularly difficult. Um, designing intera- interaction that works well across all platforms is particularly difficult. When we when we first started making Symphony, um, the primary platform that we were actually building it for was really the Vive, because it was the thing that we had available. Um, it was very easy to deploy to. It was very easy to test on. But obviously, going and making a VR game that uses room scale isn't particularly useful when you're going to also be launching on something like the PlayStation VR, um, where you can't have a room scale experience. And so making a game that can work across both of them and make the, make use of the best strengths of all of those platforms is incredibly hard to do. And it, it makes total sense as to why you see a lot of um, current VR game makers only focusing on one or two like only releasing their game on the Oculus because it has certain strengths and weaknesses that they can make use of that they just couldn't on the PlayStation VR. Well, um, I, I guess this is probably a good opportunity for us to, to sort of wrap up uh, the you know the, the hardcore interview section of the show, so what? Um, but before we do, I think we, we should probably just give anyone who has not listened to our uh, chat about Symphony um, of the Machine in the past, just maybe the brief elevator pitch as to what the game is, why you should consider um, checking it out, and uh, what you're in for if you, you basically hook this one up to your, your noggin. So take it away. What, what is Symphony of the Machine all about, and why should people care? So Randy. Symphony of the Machine is a Zen puzzle platformer. The thing that I would say is that it's a nice place to be from the start. You enter a world that looks like a blasted landscape. You tra- get transported to an ancient tower. Um, simply going up in the elevator to the top of the tower gives you a height and a scale experience that is quite emotive. And then you get handed a series of tools to, to uh, manipulate a beam of light, refract the light into symbols. That then changes the weather and grows plants around you. Um, owned to the page is called Symphony of the Machine. It has one of the most luscious soundtracks that you're ever going to hear. Um, and the thing being is we wanted to create a calming, meditative experience. The thing that I would say, even if you're a hardcore action gamer, it's still worth jumping into because you can play four hours of your hardcore action game and then you're going to want to calm down from all that before, you know, before chilling out and going to bed or doing whatever else that you're going to do at night. And that that's where this game comes in. The other thing too is someone who suffers personally from VR motion sickness. This game has been designed with a lot of that consideration in mind. So it's very, very, uh, I don't want to say the word accessible because it's not, but because VR has certain design limitations around it, but it's kind to you in a way that other VR games are not. I heard that comment firsthand from a number of people during the uh, the PAX demo, so it was a, a good one to see. All right. Um, so, uh, ladies, did you want to jump in and ask anything else before we... Where can we find Symphony of the Machine? If, if I was a person who had a VR headset, where could I buy it? Um, on Steam. Well... <laughs> on Steam, on PlayStation. <laughs> 
Great. Uh, Perfect. Pretty soon on Oculus. <laughs> <laughs> it's on PSN right now. It went live on Australia this morning, the Australian market. But it's um it's currently it's it's, it's on the US market. It's on and it's gone to Europe, Australia, NZ. Um, we're watching the Asian mainland and the Japanese markets turn up over the next day or so. Nice. How exciting. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm super keen to have a chat with you both, you know, in the, the short future and, and sort of talk about how wild the first week or so has been and what, what kind of stuff has been coming through. It's going to be great. But you've got plenty to keep yourself occupied this weekend at GX. So uh, good luck for your, your micro talks uh, gig there as well, V. I know you've got something planned that you're cooking up. Yeah, I'm just making it up as I go along. Yeah, nice. <laughs> Micro. And if you're listening to this, yeah, if you're listening to this, the GX uh, is in Sydney. So I know we've got a couple of people who listen to this in Sydney, um, at least two. Uh, so uh, if you haven't already, you should look at grabbing some tickets to GX and heading down and checking it out. Nice. All right, well, um, now, V, you've got a flight to, to jump onto. Um, Matt, w- were you keen to stick around and, and chat a bit longer? or what? I'll stick around. Stick sure. around? Awesome. All right, well, Hooray. we have uh, plenty more games to chat about, so V will bid you adieu. Now he gets to say what he really thinks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unmonitored. I did not steal V's dessert. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sweet. Spoiler alert, he totally did. All right, good night. Nice. Happy oh, trails. Bye, have see you later. fun. <laughs> All right, now we get the real story. No, we won't. All right. <laughs> anyway, so um, this gives us a really good opportunity to, to chat about uh, maybe some of the other stuff that you, I don't know if you even have time to do this, but uh, and we're, we're going to kick into some chat about uh, recent gaming now. So Matt, as, as you are sort of new to the show, we're having you on as guests for the first time. What other stuff do you actually find time to play when you're uh, not doing uh, everything at Stirfire? So is there any games that have taken your fancy recently? At the moment, I've been playing a lot of Mass Effect Andromeda because oh, nice. um, I'm a Ooh. big fan of Bioware. I'm getting myself hyped up for Destiny 2. Oh, yes. Um, so yes, yes. Very much, very much enjoy Destiny, and all the trailers for Destiny 2 have been absolutely great. What else have I played recently? Um, I finished uh, like a month or two ago um, Watch Dogs 2, which I quite enjoyed. Oh, wow. Yep. Oh. Yeah, so I do find time to play games every now and then. Big games, yeah. (laughs) A decent amount of time in all of those games. Yes, absolutely. Um, I just, you know, so my my schedule typically is I go to work. I work from 8.30 until 5.30 or 6 and come home and then I play games and then I go back to work and there's no sleep. (laughs) I'm like Luke, you're a fellow vet. I'm not seeing any flaws with this strategy at all. (laughs) Look, we're, we're convinced Luke never sleeps. Yeah. He just doesn't. Yeah. He plays games. No. <laughs> I have plenty of time to sleep when I'm, I'm dead. That's that's the time for that. So, Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> no, nice. No, I did see that uh, some of the um, brick and mortar stores were starting to take pre-orders for um, for Destiny 2 as of today, I think, because one of our um, agile crew sort of mentioned that they got some information about uh, open beta that's going to be happening for people who've pre-ordered at some point in the not-too-distant not future. There was some code that he got, which apparently gives him access to another code some codeception going on. I don't know what the story was, but yeah, that, that's going to be good fun. But I'm, I'm really actually keen, Matt. What's your take on uh, on Andromeda? Was there, um, uh, have you sort of decided where you fall on the spectrum that we've seen uh, around the place over the last month where people are, you know, either loving it because it's more Mass Effect or, you know, having issues with some of the ways that they've handled the, the new setting? What's your take on all of that? Um, so I, I feel like being a game developer, I get ruined on, on games a lot, right? Mm. It's like it's like being a movie maker and going and seeing um, the latest movie and you see all the special effects, you know exactly how it's done, yeah, right? Yeah. So going and playing Mass Effect and seeing all the animation issues and everything like that, I could be really forgiving of it because the moment I saw that, I'm like, they ran out of time. Mm. It's mm. entirely obvious that they ran out of time. And then the moment that they went and released that very first patch and it fixed most of those issues, I'm like, yeah, that that patch was probably done before the game was released. And it's just been going through the whole process of completing all the paperwork that needs to be completed and getting put onto the stores, getting tested um, and then getting launched. So mm-hmm. it's it's one of those things where, um, yeah, I, I can I can understand their pain, but I also play the game and it's like. This is more Mass Effect. I, I'm not seeing the flaw here. Yeah. Um, it's it's interesting gameplay. Um, I don't think I could actually go back from Mass Effect Andromeda and quite enjoy Mass Effect 1, 2, and 3 as much because the combat in Mass Effect Andromeda is just so much fun. The verticality of it all yeah. is just so yeah. cool. 
Yeah, the jetpack. Um, yeah, the jetpack is great. It's it's a really <laughs> cool addition. <laughs> but yeah, though no, I I thoroughly enjoy it. Um, it's got its flaws. There's absolutely no doubt about it. But it is. I still have a great time with it. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I mean, that, that's pretty much where I think we, most of us have landed on it as well. I know that Ollie in particular has loved the hell out of the game. He's been, you know, very, very positive on it um, from what I've chatted to him this week in particular about. So, um, and Jam, you've still got to actually get back and play the damn thing because you've been distracted by just about everything this week. <laughs> so I took it's my yeah, fault. Well, my fault. It was on Sorry. hiatus. <laughs> it was on hiatus because uh, I was waiting for the patch and I got distracted by Horizon. Mm. And then I got distracted by Persona. And then this week... <laughs> Imogen and I cranked up Don't Starve Together for the first because time in 18 months. Because we don't have enough to do. I know, because <laughs> I don't have this pile of shame that I'm trying to work through. And oh my God, is it hilarious. So it's released yeah. now. Last time we played it, it was still in, was it early access or? Mm. It was, mm. well, I don't know if it was early access. I feel like it was out, but It didn't was feel like an early access game. It felt a bit more polished than that. Yeah. yeah. I, I, think we, I think we picked it up either around the time that it was launching or, or those types of things. Because obviously Don't ah. Starve is a game, but Don't Starve Together as an idea. So I'm not entirely sure when we picked it up, but there was bits and pieces that we couldn't quite figure out and there wasn't a lot of information on how it all worked and everything else. And, mm. But there's been a um, number of updates since and, and mm. it's just so polished now and so much fun and it's so, so terrifying. Yeah. It's, okay, <laughs> We've forgotten it's, it's, everything. Okay. It's actually technically Jam's fault because I was looking for a reason not to study and Jam was like, I don't know, we could blah, blah, blah. And she just threw in like a list of five games and one of them was Don't Starve. And I'm like, yes, I want to play that. All right, so I just pretend that everyone's forgotten about what list. this game is. So high level overview again, what the heck is Don't Starve? <laughs> it's a uh, survival horror with little cartoony peoples where you get really hungry and die a lot. <laughs> yeah, I don't that's, know. That's pretty, that's pretty accurate. Yeah, it's a survival horror game. Uh, but not in the sense that it's, you know, scary and jump scares. It's um, like noir-themed, uh, cell-shaded uh, characters. So the art of it is what initially drew us to it. We actually played this game over New Year's of 2015-2016. Like, we yeah. played this game, and the only reason we realised that it was a New Year's is because we happened to die just before, <laughs> yeah. just before midnight. Oh, we were loading up a that. new game. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> we leave fun lives, and that's what we <laughs> do for New Year's. But it, it's been so good, and Jam and I are now super pros. We have decided. Well, we're Jam, making steady yeah. progress. Like, the first time we jumped in a few days ago, and we lasted, what, six days? Oh, something in like game? that. We were going rubbish. crazy, Absolutely we starved, rubbish. we got wet, it was cold, we didn't know what to do. Um, you have and to then, collect all of these resources and, you know, it feels very, very quickly the game can get out of hand. You get very distracted doing one particular thing and you realise that you're going insane and then monsters start appearing on the screen and attacking you <laughs> um, from the shadows. So uh, it's the insanity mechanic is my favourite bit, but yes. It's hilarious. The game, reminds me a little bit bit of, um, the game reminds me a little bit of a cross between Minecraft and Darkest Dungeon. In a way. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yes, perfect. Mm. Good job, Luke. Nice. <laughs> so we got better and we managed to survive until winter and promptly died because we had no idea what the winter mechanics were when we froze. Yep. So then we learned but about the, the winter mechanics. The first day of winter, we died. <laughs> <laughs> we, made it, we made it through the winter next time, barely, but we were feeling quite proud and then died one day after in, winter because it started spring. raining yeah. and we weren't prepared for the being drowned mechanics. Oh God. And this is when we learned the lesson that the game and... just ramps up. It never oh. left off. So yeah. once we once we conquered winter, we thought that was going to be the hardest season. Nope. Like, <laughs> we can relax. Oh, we're dead. <laughs> All of the animals were on heat and started attacking us for no particular reason. Oh, God. Uh, everything was damp and wet, and so you're miserable, and you start going insane, and then you're attacked by shadows and monsters. So, so um, there you go, Matt. If you want a nice one to relax to when you finished uh, zenning out the symphony. <laughs> It's so much fun. I mean, it's game over once you're both dead. Like, that's gone. Progress is vanished. Start from scratch. But it's it's a fun one to just pick up and work at and learn things. We're learning things every time we log on. Hmm. Yeah. Um, finding new monsters. Discovering that you can have pets. We haven't we found that we can adopt do pets. It properly, but Very we know exciting. that we can. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, at yeah, the moment, good currently, Jam and I are two spiders. Um, so <laughs> his name is Webster. Uh, which is the best name for a spider. Mm -hmm. And uh, his special ability is that he is actually a monster in the game, so he's not afraid of monsters, um, and he can befriend spiders. So what you can do is feed meat to your fellow spiders, and they become like a little gang, 
and they protect you from things. Um, what Jam and I learnt um, from the internets is if you have an area with lots of multiple spider nests, mm -hmm. you can feed one group and then attack the other one and walk away and they'll start their own spider war and you get everything, like all of their dead bodies and their, all of this, the webs and everything else, the goo that you need to make healing potions. So, spider war. So it was, you know, Jam, tomorrow morning, Spider War. You two are <laughs> we, definitely we, monsters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we we felt like, you know, we were ruling the world. We were gathering so much loot. They were fighting each other and not paying us any attention. We're like, this is great. This is fantastic. Oh, my God, we are going to survive so long. And then suddenly we hadn't been keeping track of the day and night that fell <laughs> and our fire had gone out and neither of us had materials on us to build another one. So we're running around in pitch black going, oh, God, oh, God, what's the <laughs> owl? And getting killed by the shadows in the dark. And, yeah. oh, it was just miserable. So imagine, for Don't Starve, imagine that every darkness is what you imagined as a child, that if it's dark, then anything can be there. And that's the reality and don't stop. And you're as soon as die. you're in the dark, that's where all, it's just solid monsters. Just imagine blackness as solid monsters and that's fairly apt. Uh, yeah, don't starve together. Fully recommend, especially if you have a group of people or if you're in our Steam community and you want to jump on <laughs> and you see Jam and I are playing, feel free to send us a message and join in because the more the merrier. It is so difficult by yourself and together you can sort of divide tasks and things. But Yeah, very careful resource management. Personally, I was sold on it until you said uh, until you said Spider War. Like then I was like, no, <laughs> you're not a spider fan, Matt. <laughs> no, I, I'm I'm good on the spiders. I'm good. Oh, you're just not on the war. <laughs> <laughs> spider War. Yeah. We also found this area with weaponized bees, and we found one of them. Oh, We're like, oh, God. that's not good news. Let's just keep running. And then there was another, and another, and another, until we had like so many bees. <laughs> Remind, reminds me of that Simpsons yep. episode with the dogs that you know have bees in their mouth and when they bark they yeah, shoot bees much at you. Shoot bees. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. Uh, uh, pretty well, much. Anyway, speaking of shooting things, um, I know that uh, V is a bit of a fan of the old uh, miniature war games because we've uh, you know back in the day played quite a few of those together. But uh, Matt, have you ever gotten into to that sort of thing? And uh, do you have any interest in Warhammer Forty Thousand at all? Is that something that you acknowledge? Um, so miniatures, no, but I have actually been involved in a Warhammer 40k tabletop way back in the day, and I still run tabletops today. Ah, nice. So you'll know exactly what I'm talking about when I mention uh, the Dawn of War 3 open beta that just took place over the last yes. weekend. Yeah. So I got a chance, uh, and Ollie got a chance to jump in and have a bit of a tinker around with that, because uh, we've been looking forward to this one for quite a while, being big fans of the previous games. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, was pretty fun. So it, have you played any of the, the predecessors, Matt? Did you check out the open beta by any chance, or is that something that you're interested in at all? I, I have not played the open beta. I've actually not been able to play much games in the last couple of weeks. Can't imagine why. No, it's understandable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, that, but, um, I, I love Dawn of War 2. Um, all the Dawn of Wars have been really, really good. Just the campaigns are always great. So I'm super excited about 3. Yeah, well, 3 is looking pretty good so far. I mean, they, they've definitely uh, departed from uh, the the sort of squad-focused combat of 2, and they're going back to the, uh, you know, build an army, conquer your foes kind of approach that 1 took, your traditional RTS. Mm -hmm. Um, but, I mean, there, there is a bit of micromanagement at the squad level um, in terms of the characters and some of the special abilities and stuff. So it's, it's almost like a slight hybrid between the two. Definitely a lot more like the first uh, iteration, which was my preferred game. Um, so I'm kind of happy about that. But, uh, um, yeah, the uh, the open beta was on. You got to play uh, multiplayer. You got to go through the tutorial and uh, mess around with a bunch of the different units. Um, looks and feels like Dawn of War. They've definitely captured uh, everything that I remember about the games and what I enjoyed. Um, the graphics are a definite uh, markup from, from the predecessors, which is great. Because um, obviously you'd expect that being uh, a number of years since uh, Dawn of War 2. I think Dawn of War 2 from... I'm not 100% sure, but I think it was early 2000s. So it's been quite a while since that game came out. Um, I mean, I was actually still working at Games Workshop at the time, so it must have been, you know, nearly a decade plus ago at least. So, um, so that, that's cool. But uh, the big thing that has changed uh, with this one, um, and I've not encountered a bunch of these yet, so I'm curious to see how it pans out, is some of the larger units that have made their way into the tabletop game um, have made it into Dawn of War now. So you're looking at like the Orc Gargants and the uh, the Titans, uh, like the Night Titans for the Imperial Forces and the uh, the Elder uh, sort of uh, Titans as well. 
Um, now these are kind of like epic super units, so you can you know, almost look at them as like mobile bases in a way. Um, and I've heard a bit of mixed feedback so far as to whether people have liked the power level of those things because they tend to dominate quite a bit. Um, so I, I'm keen to get a bit more stuck in and play around with those. I didn't get too much of a chance, but uh, that's kind of the thing I'm going to be focusing on. Everything else I've, I've found is, is good so far. Uh, Ollie was whinging about the uh, the orc psychers uh, um, before he found that the uh, the weird boy was a bit OP. Um, I can't attest to that, so I'll take his word for it. But uh, I don't know. I, I'm enjoying it. It's still more more of the good stuff that you love from the previous games. So uh, if you're a fan of uh, Warhammer 40,000 or you know those dark future settings in general, I think it's probably going to be worth checking out when it launches uh, next week, I think. It's coming real soon. Oh, I was going to say, if it, uh, if, depending on when it's released, I'm sure if there was a balancing issue, they'll sort that out before it's released. But in a week? Mm. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it's a balancing yeah. issue. I think it's more about managing people's expectations. Um, because if you've ever played the tabletop game with those things involved, you know what to expect when one rocks up on the table. You know, you know, you have to divert significant resources to dealing with it. Otherwise, you're not going to have a good day, <laughs> basically. So yeah. yeah. And this is why I am thoroughly unprepared for playing against you guys in this game. <laughs> I'm so screwed. Yeah, we'll see how that pans out. Um, but yeah, I mean, not a lot of other stuff going on this week. Uh, Jam and Ollie and I did some more Player Unknowns Battlegrounds adventuring, uh, which was fun. Um, was it? Yeah, was it? Mostly. <laughs> You guys died quicker than I did. <laughs> yeah. Why is that, Luke? Where uh, were you, man? I, I was maybe off somewhere doing stuff while you were getting shot at. <laughs> you were. I, yeah. I, I didn't play, but I listened to it. And listening yeah. to it, I was so annoyed at you, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I have man. an aversion to bullets. What can I say? <laughs> you have an aversion yeah. to teamwork. No. <laughs> Not that was that was fun. Ollie and I running down this little slip and getting ambushed by another squad, being like, Luke, Luke, yeah, Luke, oh, we're dead. <laughs> so this being my first week actually playing the game, I, I've realised that the tension that the game creates and, you know, the feeling of uh, being on edge because you could be shot at any moment, it seems like something that would be really unpleasant. But for somehow this game actually makes it a pleasant experience. Like it makes it a fun <laughs> kind of well, tension. I mean... <laughs> When you're not on our team, sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, it's been frustrating. But we had some, we've had some epic games though. That one where we we ended up. So there was the big blue circle that was about to shrink down to a tiny white circle, and if you end up outside the blue, you start losing health quite swiftly. We found a car, like at the last second, and we are hooning, staying just ahead of this closing zone so that we don't lose health because you know that would be very very bad and we're just managing to keep in front and then suddenly in the valley this other car swoops into the road and they're also just trying to like outstay this <laughs> blue zone Try ollie and luke are trading shots with the the spare guys in that car while i'm trying to trying to swerve around and we lose them and then another car comes along but manages to flip on something mm. i don't even know what <laughs> happened there it was nuts it's definitely a game it was, built you that person like we're gonna make it oh Epic crap flip. it landed Dead. on the roof <laughs> yeah. and we just swerved around it and laughed um <laughs> it's it's for such a, a incomplete game it's got some incredibly fun mechanics it's just very frustrating when person riding bitch on your motorbike sort of is shooting at someone and swings you know the bullets through your head mm. oh. that wasn't pleasant mm. ollie <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, me. no, wait, 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 wait. In Ollie's defense, because he's not here, I do remember a circumstance where Jam yelled, there's someone in the house, after yes. Ollie said, I'm on this level of the house, and I was about to go, up, ah, but, and then Jam shot you, shot Ollie in the head. Yeah, so, but um, <laughs> it speaks to my skills, right, that the one time I accidentally shoot him, I kill him. The two times he's accidentally tried to kill me, I survived. Right. So I'm taking it as a win. Sure. <laughs> Okay. Sure. You are an eternal optimist. Yeah. It was. It was a mistake. I thought he was a bad guy. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to screw up, you great. may as well go the whole way. Yeah. 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 Uh, I mean, I'm terrified, so I'm going to put a bullet in his face. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with that? So I would recommend Never travel this, alone with jam. I would recommend this game for uh, for corporate team building events. Um, you might want to. <laughs> Play around suggested... don't starve together and player unknown battlegrounds and you'll never speak to each other again. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh, that would be Follow funny. it up with a nice game of Monopoly. Oh god. <laughs> you really want to have no staff yes. left. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> oh god. Well, I guess the only other one we, we um, probably want to just touch on briefly, and uh, we, we're going to sort of do this in place of a, a regular news segment tonight because there's not been a hell of a lot happening this week. Um, but one notable thing that has happened is, as of today, in fact, the uh, the relaunch um, or the the launch, I should say, of Heroes of the Storm version two that actually happened earlier uh, today. So. We all got a chance to at least log in, I think. I don't know if we actually got any games in, but um, first impressions of the login process with all the changes and the, the epic loot drops that they've sort of uh, dished out to us. What, what did you think, ladies? <laughs> it was like Christmas? So much. No, <laughs> not like Christmas. Like, like a very confusing Christmas. <laughs> it's like a Christmas where you come downstairs and you sit under the tree and initially there's nothing and then suddenly there's all of these numbers around you and you have to click on them. And people are giving you presents. You're not really sure what they're used for, um, how they're relevant. And you think, okay, I'll just, no worries, I'll use this voucher that somebody gave me to spend on this other thing. Oh, wait, no, now there's three different types of currency. Okay, cool. (laughs) It's so confusing. There were so many things. And I now have 32 different heroes, which is insane, considering how many the heroes the game started with and... They all have different voice commands and you can outfit them and mounts and skins and there's there's chips and gold and gems and banners and sprays and, and <laughs> oh, emojis. Just, yeah. It's like all of the confusing parts of Overwatch. <laughs> but they put it in a MOBA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, the the, um, the freebie of all of the heroes when you log in was a nice, pleasant surprise. So there's like a starter bundle that you can uh, pick up, um, which has 20 uh, heroes in it. And if you have played a lot, you might have a few duplicates. But if you haven't played a whole bunch, um, I mean, I there was one of the bundle options um, for out of the 20 heroes, I only owned two of them. So I effectively got 18, you know, new heroes for free, which is pretty awesome. That's not bad. That like tripled my collection and then some. Um, So I was very, very satisfied with that. Um, And uh, they do give you a bunch of the new currency to sort of spend on a few bits and pieces to try out the new system, which is which is cool. So, you know, if you've actually got an existing account, you've been playing a bit. I think, um, you know, how much freebies you get is uh, based on how much progress you'd made previously. I'm not 100 percent sure how that works, but uh, no, it was nice. It was a good bonus for returning players, at least. Um, And uh Ladies, you were particularly happy today when uh, the new character got announced um, coming to mm-hmm. Heroes of the Storm from Overwatch. Um, now they're bringing on D.Va. So there you go. Hooray. Yeah. You can do your bunnies. Bunnies I, for life. I, I have to say, the thing that sold me, I was like, oh, yeah, that's cool. I can pick up. Because, you know, Lucio's been announced. Genji's been coming and the whole lot. So the Overwatch guys have been, you know, part of Heroes of the Storm for a little while now. And it hasn't really interested me. But it was when they made the connection back to Overwatch which is that thing that Blizzard always does, which is like, you know, you're buying like an entry level drug at the entry to the alleyway and you're like, okay, but I'm just going to do this much. And then you see somebody further down who has a discount. And so you walk further down the alley. That's Blizzard. (laughs) 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 They, they, They bring you into the first bit and they go, okay, you know, you might want to come back, but if you go to this guy, then you also will get like an exclusive skin for Diva, which was a really cool police skin for Diva in Overwatch. You'll get these sprays. We'll give you ten loot boxes, and I was like, "Count me in! I'm playing Heroes of the Storm." <laughs> <laughs> nice. a, a whole bunch of my friends own Heroes of the Storm just to play it whenever there's a new Overwatch skin that's going to come out. They only <laughs> play it when that's happening. Uh, I'm not surprised uh, at all. Yeah, it's uh, it's a good game, and I have to say. The fact that the only reason I will play it is if other people are interested in it. We seem to have now a group of people who are keen to start getting back into it and and playing a bit more regularly. And I'm more than happy to do that. But it's certainly not a genre, especially MOBAs, where I'm going to go play by myself because I don't hate myself like that. (laughs) I'm not going to go play with with randoms and get yelled at. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll... I'm ca- I'm going to be playing again, but Jam, are you actually going to reinstall Heroes of the Storm? Will Jammy be I mean, right again? <laughs> probably. <laughs> yeah. Likely. Yeah, you should do yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> as, soon, as soon as she sees everybody else online playing it, Jam will reinstall Heroes of the yeah. Storm. <laughs> and that, that is going to happen based off, uh, you know, the rumblings today. I think we're going to have a big group of us on again, which is, is pleasing to see. So... Yeah, mm-hmm. is good. All right. Well, anyway, we're we're pushing up on uh, you know mid evening now, and uh, Imogen, you've got a, a real world uh, big people responsibility tomorrow, so we need to actually get you mm-hmm. off to bed to have some some good nine eyes. So yeah, I have an ex- I have an exam tomorrow evening, and to all of the people who put exams at six p.m. at night, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, and uh, I mean, no doubt, Matt, your week is going to continue at breakneck pace as well. So uh, thank you very much for coming on tonight and, and gracing us with your stories. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to, to catching up with you again in person and uh, and maybe checking out the new stir, stir fire digs at some point in the not too distant future. Absolutely. It's been it's been great fun. Awesome. Great. All right. Well, um, as per usual, if you want to uh, catch us uh, via the emails, you can do so at mail at partyloaded.com. Uh, also, we handle correspondence via our Facebook page, which is just facebook.com slash partyloaded. Uh, you can catch us on Twitter at Party Loaded Show. Uh, we have got video content up on YouTube. So go to youtube.com slash channel endgame. And you can, of course, find our interview with uh, Lisa and V from Stirfire from last year's PAX Australia, uh, where we get to actually look at some of the visuals there and you'll get a feel for what the game looks like um, but on that note you should also check out the new mixed reality trailer that just dropped this week for the game too which is super super cool so I'll uh, put a link to that in the show notes uh, we're also on Steam as uh, the ladies mentioned and uh, you can also find every episode of our show on iTunes so if you do check it out there please leave us a review and uh, let us know what you thought in the comments um, we'll be back again in seven days time probably with the, the full OG crew um, to talk about uh, our party game of the month which is is what jam? What are we looking at next week? Epic Manager. That's the one. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyways, well, we don't need to watch the X episode now. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Well, you done? We, we won't spoil it now. More on that in seven days' time. So uh, anyway, thank you very much to V. Uh, thank you very much to Matt. Thank you very much, ladies. And we will see everybody again in one week's time. But for night, ta ta. Good night. Bye. See ya. The Party Loaded Podcast is a Channel Endgame production. For this and more great gaming content, bookmark channelendgame.com. <laughs>